Hi, everybody. It's me, Anna Winger, the host of Science and Stuff. And I just want you to know that they make be, me be quiet for 10 whole seconds before they turn on the camera. And it is the hardest 10 seconds of my life. But they finally turned on the sound and said I could talk. So here we are at this episode of Science and Stuff, which you're really going to love. I am the showrunner of Mission Unstoppable, a show about the leaders working in science, technology, engineering, and math that airs every Saturday morning on CBS. Um, and uh, we are here today to bring you even more science, technology, engineering, and math. We have two special guests today. They will bring the science. I will bring the stuff. And um, first up is molecular neuroscience n neuroscientist, Dr. Crystal Dilworth, AKA Dr. Brain. If you watch Mission Unstoppable, we'll, we call her Dr. Brain. She's one of my favorite people. Can't wait to talk to her. Also up from last week's episode, we have robotic roboticist and robot choreographer, Katie Kwan. She is amazing and actu actually literally teaches robots how to dance. Uh, so she's a fantastic guest and will be on right after Dr. Brain. And now it's time for everybody's favorite segment. <laughs> Yes, it's time for science newsy news that will impress your friends that you can't stop thinking about even if you wanted to. Our first story, this may be my favorite science story of all time. Uh, studies confirm that slow blinks really do work to communicate with your cat. Yes, new research has found that humans can communicate with cats, not by meowing, but through blinking. Yes, if you narrow your eyes and blink slowly at your cat, that will mimic a cat's smile. Um, a team of psychologists from the University of Sussex found that slow blinking is a great way to enhance the bond with your own cat or even cats that you have never met before. So, Freddie, if you're out there and you're watching, I just want to say... Perfect. Um, uh, here's how you do it. Try narrowing your eyes at a cat as you would in a relaxed smile. So like when you smile in a relaxed way, your eyes kind of get more narrow. Um, and followed by closing your eyes for a couple of seconds and you'll find that they respond the same way themselves and you can start a conversation, kind of. I mean, if you want to have a conversation where you're like, blink, blink, blink blink but it really does calm them down and it's something that i uh, noticed and now thank god it has been proven by scientists at the university of sussex so thank you for that important study uh next up oh this is great too they've discovered a new planet a study published in the Astronomical Journal last month reported that a new planet has been found. It is called K2-315b, and that, uh, uh, that planet is orbiting a low-mass star about a fifth the size of the sun. Now, this planet flies around that star at a whopping 181,000 miles per hour, which is crazy, and completes a full orbit of that star in 3.14 days, hence its nickname Pi. Get it? 3.14 Pi. So yes, the Pi planet, uh, the temperature on the Pi planet is actually estimated to be at about 350 degrees Fahrenheit, which um, further confirms why it was nicknamed the Pi Planet, because you can bake a pie at approximately 350 degrees Fahrenheit. So hopefully we'll get there someday and just be able to put a bunch of pies all over it willy-nilly and bake like 40 of them at once. And that is what space travel is all about. Um, next story. Oh, this is great. I mean, it's great as in very interesting but also slightly scary. The first live murder hornet, which we all heard so much about earlier this year, uh, was captured in the US. Here's a picture of it. Look at the size of that thing. Um, the, it was first discovered in the US, yes, yeah, sending us into a frenzy. Lucky for me, I haven't had the misfortune of seeing one of these things in the wild, um, thankfully, and I don't think many of us have. Uh, but earlier this month, an entomologist in Washington state caught a live murder hornet and attempted to tape a GPS unit to the hornet's back, but it was uncooperative, you think? 
Look at that thing. It didn't want a GPS unit uh, taped to its back. I would love to know how big that GPS unit. In fact, if for if our next science and stuff, if we could get a picture of that GPS unit, like I'm just curious how small a GPS unit gets. But I do think that if it was small enough, you could put it on that murder hornet because that thing is huge. Um, entomologists aren't giving up though. Traps are being set around the state in hopes of catching more hornets and reattempting the GPS tracking, which will lead us to the hornet nests so that we can destroy them for good. That would be great. And all of that wraps up this week's even if you wanted to. Uh, let's bring our first guest, Dr. Crystal Dilworth, also known to us here at Mission Unstoppable and me personally as Dr. Brain. Dr. Brain, where are you? There she is. Hi, Crystal. Hello. How are you? Hi, it's nice to see you. It's oh, so, so good. good. To I know. I'm so excited to see you. And um, I, yes, I call you Dr. Brain. Does anybody else call you Dr. Brain? Or is it just me? Um, no, like <laughs> maybe my it's gonna mom catch on. because she's like, gonna... super excited about me being on TV. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, we're going to do um, so many more fun things with Dr. Brain someday. That uh, it's, to it. yes, that I'm sure uh, you, you, Dr. Brain will soon become a household name. Okay, I'm supposed to do your official, I'm supposed to read your official intro. Crystal Dilworth is a molecular neuroscientist whose specialty lies in studying how chemicals in our brains influence our behavior. Crystal also travels the world as a science communicator, interviewing other scientists to help spread their knowledge and findings to the public. And you're also an incredible dancer, right? Like almost yeah, like you kind a, of have a dance themed episode. Yeah, I know. I was thinking about that. Yeah, this this episode is like a dance themed episode because you're a neuroscientist, but also, I mean, you were all, you almost uh, decided to be a ballerina professionally, right? But then decided that you wanted to get into neuroscience. Yeah, I really had to choose between dance and and science. And I was actually in New York studying at Alvin Ailey, which is the company that's I uh, that. represented behind me. Yes. Yeah, and I decided, no, you know what? I think career is going to be science. Yeah, that is awesome. Do you still dance though? Do you still dance just for funsies? Uh, then? Less now uh, than I did. Like when I was in grad school, I definitely yeah. kept taking class and kept it up, but I kind of transitioned into the, the scientist choreographer role. So all of nice. the Caltech musicals or stage shows that needed some kind of choreographer, I would be there helping the engineers to Which, tell the difference yes. between their right and left foot. <laughs> Which I love. Oh, that's so cute. Telling them, teaching them how to dance. That I would love to see that. Oh my gosh, that's a show in and of itself. I have heard about these Caltech musicals before, and I have never been able to see one. But I definitely is something I've got to see in the future. Like a it's bunch a of unique stuff. genre of theater. Yeah, I love it. I love any kind of theater. Um, but okay, so now let's get in. Let's get to the science, though. So you have a PhD in molecular neuroscience. Will you tell our audience what exactly is molecular neuroscience? The brain as an organ is made up of many, many different types of cells called neurons. And the neurons can talk to each other and actually have to talk to each other in order for them to do their jobs in two different ways. So they use electricity and they use chemicals. And there's many different chemicals that we call neurotransmitters. And so I studied the chemicals that transmit messages between neurons. Oh, wow. So specifically the chemicals that transmit the messages um, between the neurons in your brain. Oh, that's that's fascinating. And um, did you, oh, this is, this is just a funny, this is, this is a funny interview question. Out of all the organs, how did you decide on the brain? Did you ever consider the pancreas? <laughs> <laughs> well, I never considered the organs individually, but I guess I just like people. Like people are weird and they're hard yeah. to understand and, uh, you know, yeah. they act in ways you don't expect and if you want to understand people you kind of have to understand that 
big bowl of jello that's rattling around up in your skull. Yeah, yeah. And this is a segment, this is a clip from our show where you were telling us how when, you know, how when uh, you get hit with something or you get hurt with something, um, they say to rub it to make it feel better. But what you taught us was that actually what that does is you've got these pain receptors, right, that are sending the message to your brain that like you're in pain, you're in pain. When you rub that spot, it confuses or or it gives you more information. So you then feel the feeling on your hand as well as on your arm, and then it makes it feel better because now your brain is having to interpret all of these uh, other messages yeah. at the same time, right? Exactly. It's like if you were my brain and I was telling you, hey, you're in pain, you'd be able to understand that. But if I was telling you, hey, you're in pain and 200 other people were yelling at you completely different things, you probably wouldn't hear my message amongst all of those other people's. Right. And so you wouldn't know what to respond to. Right, right. And I think that, and thank God I got that right, by the way. Can you imagine if I didn't, if I had a shot and filmed that whole thing and didn't get the message? But yeah, no. And I think it's so fascinating because you think of kind of, um, and we've had this conversation before, like everything having to do in your brain is willpower, right? Like you just need to have willpower. But there's really all of these physical things that are happening in your brain that um, help to dictate your behavior. Yeah, and automatic yeah. responses. And, you know, you can only have so much willpower. You know, you can only think and focus on controlling so many things at once. Um, and so, yeah, it's not it's not about, like, how strong you are mentally right. as much as it is training new behaviors to become automatic so you can think about other things. Right. And, and I know that you specialize in addiction and specifically, you know, helping people and, and figuring out what the brain has to do with that and, and what we can do to help people get better um, uh, using neuroscience. But I, it's almost like behavioral, um, it's bit like brain training is exactly what you were saying. And you were talking about it, we were talking about it in a way of like a sugar addiction before, like and how yeah, that works. Yeah, I mean, works. there's so many different things that, that come into play when you're trying to break a habit or yeah. Um, I don't want to say the word cure, but adjust an addictive adjust. behavior or become yeah. less less dependent on a substance. You know, you actually have changed your brain chemistry by eating all of that sugar or smoking mm -hmm. that cigarette, which is my area of expertise. Um, and so you need to train new pathways to mm -hmm. get rid of the behavior that you've learned is the, you know, the one that you want. But that can apply to anything, right? Like if I'm used to waking up every morning and having a cup of coffee and not jogging, then my brain is going to want to do that every morning and it's going to be hard to start a new behavior, right? Like it applies to, to any kind of new behavior or habit that you would want to change. It does. But when we're talking about being dependent on a particular substance, mm. uh, like sugar, like caffeine, which is in your coffee, yeah. or like nicotine, which is in cigarettes, you have actually changed the proteins, like the composition of the cells in your brain have changed to crave and to want more mm. of that substance. Mm -hmm. And so it is very, it's, it's more difficult to adjust behaviors that are based on your biology mm. than it is to change behaviors that are based on, I don't enjoy jogging. But it's still difficult to enjoy jogging. <laughs> and it does have to do with your brain, right? There are- It there, does. So tell us, talk about some, that. Yeah. Some people- <laughs> I love this. Have the yeah. opposite. They're addicted to jogging. So that yes. same pleasurable effect that you get when you drink your coffee, they yeah. are not getting from their coffee. They're getting it from their 5K run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, so yeah. they've learned that the positive feedback comes from running. And so in order to become a runner as opposed mm -hmm. to a Starbucks aficionado, of which I am one, yes. you know, you would need to slowly start moving that positive reward, that pleasure right. from the right. coffee to to the jogging and that could take months, years, a lifetime. But that's like, but you were talking about neuroplasticity in one of the segments that we did on the show. Uh, talk mm -hmm. about that, about learning like a new habit. Like if you want to learn a new skill or uh, if you want to get better at sports or you want to get better at swinging a bat or a golf club or something like that, that has to do with yeah, neuroplasticity. I mean, 
that's the coolest thing about being yeah. humans is that by doing the same repetitive thing over and over, whether it's math problems on your homework or, mm -hmm. you know, perfecting your swing at a softball and, and telling yourself over and over again, this is the right way to do it. This is the right way to do it. You actually are growing new connections between your neurons that are using both chemicals and electricity to tell mm -hmm. you this is the right way to do it. Um, and that's what you want. You want to change your brain. So your brain is plastic like Play-Doh. That's kind mm -hmm. of what neuroplasticity means is that it mm -hmm. can change create those new connections and then make them so strong through practice that you don't have to think about it anymore. Right. You know, when you first started learning softball, you had to think about how to swing at the ball every time. But then four years later, you're an expert and you're refining it. Mm -hmm. um, that's mm -hmm. because of how you've changed your brain, you've grown those connections, you've strengthened them. And now you don't have to think about it. You can think about other things. Yes, and and so the the old adage, uh, uh, "practice makes perfect," is actually physically true, and the fact that happens in your brain. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it's also why you can't show up and be a completely different person on game day than you were in practice. Mm. You know, like sometimes we show up and we're like, "Okay, today is the game," so I'm really going to try. It's like, no, your brain learned it one way. Yeah. And it needs a lot of time to like suddenly become, you know, that softball star that you, um, you know, yeah. admire. So you can only be yourself. Ah, I love it. I love it. Okay. So next up, we are going to talk about oh, weird science. So tell us what your most extreme science moment has been, either in your education or your career. Well, I mean, I guess during my graduate school days, I basically spent a lot of my time in a dark room shooting lasers at brain cells and making them glow in the dark. Cool. So that's, that's pretty extreme. So actual <laughs> mouse brains that we have changed their DNA so that these mice have fluorescent cells in their brains. Wow. And then we can treat them with nicotine we can treat them with other drugs that we want to know how the brain responds and we can look at changes in these fluorescent green signals mm. and we can we can say oh well when the brain was exposed to nicotine there's less green fluorescence or when it was exposed to nicotine there was more green fluorescence and that tells us a lot about how the brain is adjusting to these drugs and then that tells us things about addiction and about just normal biological process. Right, right. So the, the having uh, it glow fluorescent allowed you to kind of see how the chemicals were moving around in the brain? Or yeah. tell it's me exactly again. exactly like putting a bell on your younger sibling because you want to know if they're following you. You know, the uh, bell is the tag that tells you, like, this is where my younger sister is. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, in the house. Um, but instead of using sound, we use light. So anywhere that I see green, I know that the protein that I'm studying is in that part of the cell. And so I that's can watch crazy. it move and respond. And then that's my data. <laughs> uh, that's so cool. That's so cool. I'm, I'm so interested in this. Um, but we need to move on to our game. Our game, it's a game we play with all of our guests called I Know Everything About. Each of our guests are expert at something, so we create a game especially for each of you. Crystal, the title for your game is I Know Everything About Brains. And um, in this version of I Know Everything About, we're going to show you photos of 10 sea creatures. And if they have a brain, you're going to say, brain. And if they don't have a brain, you're going to say, no brain. Uh, and by okay. playing... How, how are we defining brain? Okay. This is a great question. Okay. Because I am not a neuroscientist, um, but I believe that we're defining brain as uh, a centrally located organ that, that contains like the, what is it? Hold on. Let me read, read this. An organ functioning as the center of a central nervous system. But because I think that like a lot of sea creatures have a decentralized, like like their brain is basically all over their body rather than in one spot, right? Yeah. Sea creatures are really tricky. This is you you have really upped the difficulty factor for this. But I'll try and I'll try and use that definition of brain as an organ controlling a central nervous system and we'll see how we do. 
Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. Cool, 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 cool. Here we go, here we go. And oh, and uh, oh, did we show her the prestigious science and stuff leaderboard? Oh, this is the prestigious science and stuff leaderboard. Uh, Mission Unstoppable leaderboard. Yep, it says there at the top. Okay, so, well, it's the science and stuff leaderboard, but okay. And we have three people tied for first with 10. So if you get 10 out of 10, you can go to our tournament of champions, which I decided today that we're going to have because so many people. But to be fair, Crystal, like, honestly, a lot of people just, like, like Katie has to guess dances that, I, that I'm going to do. So some of the games are harder than others. It's something we're working on, but you know, this is the fourth episode of Science and Stuff, and we do want our games to be consistent with it. We're gonna get there, we're gonna get there. But for right now, let's play Brain or No Brain. First up, okay, is, part of the process. Thank y'all. Um, first up is a C star, Brain or No Brain. Uh, no Brain. That's right, No Brain. Oh, I've got, I've got applause. <laughs> Perfect. It goes on for a kind of long time. Okay, next up we have a sea sponge. No brain, but sea sponges are really cool. That okay, great. No brain, but sea sponges are really cool. That's correct. That's correct. Um, I really feel like we're on a roll here. Um, next up is sea spider. Sea spider. If they're like land spiders, then they should have a centralized organ. That's so, right, yes, it's brain. brain. Sea spider brain. Okay. And I do I do really want to know more about a sea spider because that thing is like freaky looking and it really does look like a spider. And I'm like, is it an arachnid? Is it a crustacean? I'm not sure. But, you know, it's something that we'll answer on the next episode of Science and Stuff. Um, next, we have the Cassiopeia, Cassiopeia, sorry, the Cassiopeia jellyfish. Look at that thing. Isn't it pretty? Is that it upside is down? Gorgeous. I think the tentacles it looks like an away. anemone. It looks like an anemone because the tentacles are up, but I think it, I think our picture might be. You know what? Let's just say it's a Cass, Cassiopeia jellyfish swimming upside down at the moment. Uh, but what we really want to know. Either way, no brain. Yes, either way, no brain. <laughs> Whether it's upside down or not, it has no brain. Next up. Okay, next up, Dumbo octopus, which I feel like is kind of mean. Like, why are we calling this a Dumbo octopus? I mean, I guess it kind of oh. looks like an elephant. Dumbo octopus, or octopus, brain or no brain? Octopus are definitely smart. brain. Definitely, definitely. Brain. Absolutely. I mean, even I knew that. Even I knew that one. Um, okay, here we go. Oh, seahorse, seahorse, brain or no brain? I'm gonna say brain. Absolutely brain, absolutely. And um, I have an extra fun fact about seahorses. I have an extra fun fact about seahorses. Female seahorses' brains are 4.3% heavier than male seahorses' brains, which is interesting. Did not know that. I don't know what that means, but it's a fun fact nonetheless. Ooh, sea cucumber. I love sea cucumbers. Look at that thing, man. It looks spectacular. Brain or no it's brain? Prehistoric and intimidating, doesn't it? I'm going to go with no brain. No brain. You're right. I mean, she is killing it. I mean, you're 7 out of 7 right now. Really, really Love going. Jinx me. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. You're right, you're right, you're right. Okay, next up, next up. Sea squirt. That thing is neon. Look at it. Sea squirt. Brain oh, or no so brain? It's really beautiful. Pretty. I I'm gonna go no brain. No brain is right. No brain is right. I feel like all of those like glowy things are probably its nervous system, like all over its body. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Oh, next up, squid. Brain or no brain? Squids are related to octopi so i will say brain i love the reasoning going on here and ladies and gentlemen this is why she's a scientist okay she uses logic next number 10 here we go sea snail Ooh, this is hard the but hardest I mean, if, you, if you think about last. a sea slug and you know you know you got that one right i'm gonna say no brain yes yes a okay. 10 out of 10 Woo! 10 out of 10 for Crystal Dilworth. I know everything about brains. Yay, I'm so happy. Now you get to come to our tournament of champions. I'm oh, ready. Okay. I'm ready. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, we have um we have another fun segment called Would You Rather? 
This is a good one. Would you, I mean, it's kind of a good one. Would you rather eat a frontal lobe or a cerebellum? I mean, the answer is no. Can you just answer no, Elena? Does she have to pick one? Mm -hmm. She has to pick one, my producer says. I could use more balance in my life, so I'm yeah. going to go cerebellum. <laughs> that, that's just the balancing. The yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> there we go. I got my chipmunk laugh to break. No, but that is a good joke because cerebellum is the um, is the. Tell us what part of the brain that is. I was going to, and then I'm like, you know what, Anna, don't bother. Part? Yeah, and then it sort of controls the system that helps mm. with your balance. Oh, balance, like physical balance. Yeah, oh, physical nice. balance. Oh, like like, like when you're on a balance beam, your cerebellum's working real hard. Oh, I love that. Next, oh, they're like, stop talking about the cerebellum, Anna. And talk about Cool Ranch versus Nacho Cheese. I love this. It's like a brain part that tastes like Cool Ranch or Nacho Cheese, which is basically like, do you like Cool Ranch or Nacho Cheese better? Okay, look, for snacking on its own, Nacho mm -hmm. Cheese, absolutely. But for putting into sandwiches, Dude, I do cool that ranch. too. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Everybody should do that. Um, and you should really, you should really listen to Dr. Brain about that because she has a PhD in neuroscience and put, put cool ranch chips into your sandwiches. Next up, would you rather be forced to call the brain the squishy boy or be forced to call the brain head noodles? Let's head try noodles. it. In this. Head noodles. You would rather eat too. Noodles. Me too. It's just yeah, funnier. It's yeah, noodling it, it, on your noggin. It is. And it like if I was going to introduce you and be like, this is my friend, Dr. Brain. She's going to examine your squishy boy. It's like that doesn't, people don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. But if I go, this is my friend, Dr. Brain. She's going to examine your head noodles. Then it's just right on the money. Everybody knows what that is. I agree with you. Um, would you rather have all human brains become twice as big or all human brains become half as big? I didn't read that one in the in the rehearsal, so I don't have an answer for that one. The low hanging, it's like to say twice as big because the implication that we will then become twice as smart. But is that true? Brains don't really work like that. Yeah. But you know, let's see what we could do with brains the size of whales. Why not? <laughs> sure. Let's see. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Next up. Oh, would you rather have your nickname changed from Dr. Brain to Professor Noggin or have your nickname changed from Dr. Brain to Hetty McBrainhead? Smart lady. <laughs> um, I love the Dr. Brain nickname. I don't want to change it. She loves it. See, I told you. Here, listen. <gasps> listen. Dr. Brain. I wanted to do like an animated intro for you and all of that stuff, but um, just didn't get a chance to. But we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Um, I, I love it. Excellent. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, would you rather have twice as much serotonin or twice as much dopamine? And can you tell us the difference between serotonin and dopamine? Because I don't know. Ooh, I was just there. thinking, like, if you have too much serotonin, you might sleep a lot. Oh. But serotonin is corresponding to, like, elevated mood but like mm. in a consistent way you know like you're just mm. consistently happier so you want to raise right. serotonin levels if you're depressed but dopamine is like the big sparkly one like when yeah. when you see something that you love yeah. or yeah, yeah or you know when you get addicted to your coffee you're addicted to that dopamine hit you get from that first taste of caramel macchiato or whatever it is mm -hmm. you're you're drinking um i think that i would like to have twice as much dopamine yeah. But if that happened, my personality might start to exhibit some, like, ADHD-type ah, behaviors. So it might get a little I weird. see. Well, I mean, hey, you know, if it happened, we, we just see what happens. Uh, <laughs> this one, would you rather pronounce neuron neuron or neurine? This is such a hard one. I don't remember rehearsing this. <gasps> I mean, neuron, I mean, <laughs> neuron. Uh, yes, it's much yeah. better. It's much better. Um, would you rather be on the soccer team or the debate team? Debate team. Ta -da! Well, that was certainly a wonderful way to end on the debate team. <laughs> So very exciting. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to see you soon personally. Um, and uh, we're going to make some 
more fantastic content for everybody to enjoy. Um, and tell us where you, where we can find you on social media for all the people out there who want to follow you on social media. So I'm at Polly Crystal HD. P-O-L-Y-C-R-Y-S-T-A-L-H-D. It's P-H-D with my name in the middle. That's sort of ah, where we're going with that. Um, like on Twitter and Instagram mostly. So Yay, everybody. That's Crystal Dilworth, my favorite neuroscientist. We'll see you soon. Bye. 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 I love you. I love her. Seriously, she's great. Um, oh, next up, I love Katie Kwan, too. And I've never met Katie Kwan, but because I've watched her segment 8,000 times while I was making the show, I totally feel like I know her. Um, so Katie Kwan is a roboticist and a dancer. As a professional dancer in New York City, she started dancing with robots during artistic residencies at ThoughtWorks, TED, and the, Univers <laughs> the University of Illinois. Oh, there she is! Hey, Katie Kwan! <laughs> Hey, how's it going? Anna, it's so great to be here. I we've met before. <laughs> we've met before, but I feel like I know you much better because I've watched your segment so many times and I know everything about you. Um, but I was going to tell the audience that um the reason so you're working with robots to make robots more personable, have more human traits, so that we as humans can feel more comfortable. Dances with robots, I love that. Somebody just wrote that. Um, uh, so that we as humans can feel more comfortable ar around robots. And you were inspired to do so because your father had a stroke in 2014 and he was in the hospital and all of the big giant machines around him that were keeping him alive and necessary to his recovery were rather intimidating and cold. And so your work in making uh, robots more personable is to make us more comfortable with them so that these, you know, life-saving machines can, you know, make humans more comfortable rather than feel threatened. Totally. I also would add in there to make them more intuitive to use. Mm -hmm. Right now, you need a lot of skills and training in order to operate some big, heavy, stiff robots. And in the future, it would be great if we were all robot experts and knew how yes. to use them, just like we all know how to use our smartphones and laptops. Yes. So my hope is not only for these machines to be less scary, but also a lot more easy for many different people, especially folks like my dad, to be able to use. You know what, Katie? That is so beautiful because I feel like a lot of different scientists or engineers or people, they really like their specialty and they want, you know, they're like, well, this is just something that I understand because I have a PhD. But you're like, no, we should all understand robots and we should all be able to work with robots. And I just think that's a really beautiful thing. Thanks, Anna. I like to also mention, you know, like when bicycles were first introduced to mm -hmm. the public, people were really afraid of them. Um, <laughs> same sure. for cars. Folks yeah. thought, what are these big, heavy, moving metal objects? And slowly but surely, we learned to be in control of them and use them to travel to brand new places and also create really fun niche bicycling clubs and yeah you know, so I think there's a real opportunity for us to think of robots as great tools that can supplement our lives and not you know be scary intimidating machines yeah yeah no I think that's really really cool oh and you are currently in your third year pursuing your PhD in mechanical engineering at Stanford University Right. Mm -hmm. I and was you, doing my homework right before this. <laughs> oh, good. Well, keep it up because we need you to get that <laughs> PhD. Um, so and now you have a history in dance as well, right? Uh, you you have danced your whole life. Tell me about your background in dance. I started dancing when I was well, I started dancing in the studio when I was probably three or four. But my mm -hmm. family is Cuban. And there's mm -hmm. a nice joke amongst Cubans that if you don't know how to dance, something's going on. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, You're not who I would you say you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would say social dancing is a big part of my life, too. But before I went to grad school, I was a professional dancer in New York City for a number of years. And I call myself a robot choreographer because I use that dance lens in my research. 
I lost you okay, at great. and I. We cut to this awesome picture of what it looks like you dancing with a <laughs> robot at a TED Talk. Yes. So go ahead. Continue. I that, no, I, I was just going to say that uh, I call myself a robot choreographer because I bring my uh, dance expertise as a, as a body of learning um, into the work that I do with robots. And I think that many more, uh, I would love to see many more people become robot choreographers in the future. There are a few already, but there could be many, many more. Yes, yes. And um, now, now talk about like how you teach robots to dance. Like what does that exactly mean? So I'll mention a couple different ideas that I'm interested mm -hmm. in. Uh, one is really using humans to be inspirations for how robots can move. So these would be things like maybe taking pictures of people or using videos of folks who have danced in the past or human demonstrations. And people tend to use nice, fluid, beautiful motions. So let's use folks as, as inspirations for how we can make robots move. That's sort of one, one body of, of things that I'm interested in. Um, the second thing I'm interested in is very well shown in this this Mission Unstoppable segment, which is that people should be able to move around with robots. So you can see me, I'm, I'm touching the robot there. Yes. I'm sort of in this weird tactile improv duet with the robot and Danny is yeah. actually teleoperating it from a distance. So I think there's a cool opportunity when we consider this idea of teaching robots how to dance. It's actually like humans dancing with other humans, but mediated through technology. So using robots and using teleoperation haptic devices uh, in order to have that, that dance-based interaction. And then I think the third one is literally treating a robot like an entity that can be choreographed. So when right. we, when I, as a choreographer, will choreograph other humans, you know, maybe I'll give them a nice sequence of poses to try, or I'll give mm -hmm. them a verbal um, set of cues, but how those behaviors then become nice motions. Maybe we try to emphasize a certain smoothness or certain trajectories, certain relationships between the joints. Um, that's a more of kind of like direct, literal choreography. So those are the three things I'm really interested in at this point is kind of learning from people, then people actually dancing with each other mediated through machines. And then mm -hmm. this, this third idea, which is like choreographing and programming a robot directly. That is so cool. And what would you say, what are some of the places where we would be able to use robots that move more realistically or that have the qualities that you're hoping to teach them? Right now, lots of robots exist in the world, millions of mm -hmm. robots, but mm -hmm. many of them are uh, behind factory doors, mm -hmm. they're in cages, they're used in manufacturing, mm -hmm. and they're very heavy, they're stiff, they're usually bolted to the floor. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to see inklings that new robots in the future will not be that way. They'll be mobile, they'll be autonomous, they'll move around people. Roomba is a great small example, but also yeah. lots of other examples like Pepper, and even this now robot that I've danced with before. So I think in places like airports, hospitals, homes, mm -hmm. grocery stores, we're already seeing some robots. So it would be nice in those cases that if you were trying to pick up a box of Cheerios, some robot didn't come scurrying by you. Maybe it realizes, oh, you know, Katie's reaching for a box of Cheerios. I'm going to kind of slow my speed. So she yeah, knows yeah, so this yeah. is a little bit of like stopping someone in the grocery aisle. We kind of look at each other, you know, acknowledge that that person's there and I, I can move around them. Um, it would not right. be great if a robot like came up to you very quickly as you were reaching for some limes. Right, right, <laughs> right, 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 exactly. Um, now, how long do you think before robots are actually better than us at dancing? Will they ever be? Never gonna happen. Yeah, never <laughs> gonna happen. Yeah. I knew that was the answer. I knew that. Exactly. So <gasps> A few things about that. The first one is that dancing with robots gives me so much more respect for how incredible human dancers are and how mm -hmm. gorgeously they can move and pick up new movement based material and adjust. And how to different... efficient our bodies yes. are and incredible. Many, yeah, physically. Mm -hmm. Millions of years of evolution have done us well. Yes, we are very efficient. And actually, there's a whole body of research from one of my secondary advisors, Osama Khatib, that looks at how we are able to minimize effort in our muscles simply by the way that we carry and hold things. It's not something that uh, you can necessarily you know, teach immediately. Certainly, mm -hmm. folks have, have tried to 
teach robots uh, energy conservation, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, it's something that we, we tend to do intuitively and, and very well. Um, so I think that's, that's one thing that I, I feel very inspired by is, wow, human beings, human dancers were, were pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, and then the open thing I'll say about that is that styles of dance tend to be native to the body, right? So mm. ballet sort of looks the way that it does because most, most people, not all, but most people tend to have two arms and two legs and they, they sort of stand and you have this nice bilateral symmetry and that's sort of the assumption for, for how most ballet should start. And robots look completely different than we do. Their morphologies are very different. They have different numbers of limbs. And so when I think about being better or worse at dancing, I actually think that it's completely, it's like apples and oranges. I mean, how do you even compare how humans dance and yeah. move versus robots? Yeah. Uh, 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 now, Slurpy Burpy, one of our uh, Twitch followers, asks the following question. Has a robot ever taught its own dance? Great question. I'm sure one has. Yeah. <laughs> Not that. Not that I'm immediately aware of, but I'm sure it has happened before. I think one thing I've been a little intrigued by is you know robots that can program or choreograph themselves. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you still have a human that built that robot. You have a human that created whatever algorithm it is using to choreograph itself. So there's definitely a human creator hand in there somewhere. But the levers of abstraction that take that person away can be hard to see sometimes. Yes. So the answer slurpy burpy is kind of, but we're not really <laughs> sure. <laughs> Yes. You have the best Twitch name I have ever seen. Slurpy Burpy, we love your Twitch name. That's the answer to your question about robots. Um, okay, uh, next. In the next decade, what are some ways you think robots will change our society in a way that we perhaps don't expect? Great question. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of big macro problems that are mm. facing us, right? Climate change. What do you mean? You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, live in, I live in California and we spent the better part of the month of September and part of October not being able to go outside because of the smoke. I live right by that fire, yeah. By mm -hmm. one of the many and fires. One of the many. And mm -hmm. I have I grew up in California. We never used to see fire seasons like mm -hmm. we do now. And mm -hmm. when I think about the big kind of macro problems that we're facing things like climate change, I think increasing inequality, um, you know, which part of that is access to better, higher paying jobs. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that- That would be awesome. Robotics, yeah, yeah, robotics and the ways that robots might be able to help with some of these things. I'm not entirely sure. I know robots are being considered to clean solar panels in the desert, you know, many mm -hmm. millions of miles mm -hmm. of solar mm -hmm. panels and they need to be cleaned. Um, yeah. It's a tough thing to do in 110 degree heat. It sure. would be great if you could have a robot that could go along there and yeah. clean those solar panels, get more access to clean renewable energy. Yeah. Um, I also think about instances where maybe people are doing jobs that are really dangerous. Um, I think one of them is kind of bomb defusal. I also think about in uh, Japan when there was a big earthquake and you needed to have people going and exploring nuclear reactors. That was a great job for robots because it was a way that people could stay far away and stay safe. Yeah. So in the next you know, five to 10 years from now, I think we're going to see many more applications of robots yeah. in those cases. Definitely. God, I love that. That's so exciting. Um, oh, next up, we asked all we ask all of our guests about oh, this in this segment called Weird Science. We ask, what is the most sciencey experiment or project you've done, either in your education or career? Most sciencey. Oh my gosh. I mean, how do you define like sciencey? Oh, did you just <laughs> move on? Oh, here we go. Yeah. No, because we were talking, it's basically, uh, you mentioned to our producer about an underground robot that you worked with. Totally. So in where I live in Palo Alto, there's mm -hmm. this place called Lake Lagunita, which is not mm -hmm. a real lake because there's no water in it. Mm -hmm. But it's actually a sort of big hole in the ground. And there are a lot of squirrels that like to burrow there. But not only squirrels that like to burrow, also tiger salamanders. And California tiger salamanders are endangered. Mm. And one of the things that biologists and, and people at Stanford started to realize is that they really like to burrow in squirrel burrows. The tiger salamanders really like to create some of their habitats in squirrel burrows. Mm. 
but they didn't know how often are they doing this, where are they doing it, and it's not, you know, these burrows are quite small. It's not like you can just peek your, your head right. down and stare at the yeah. dark abyss. Um, so we used a robot actually to explore some of these squirrel burrows. And this is a robot called the Vine Robot. It looks like a snake. Yeah, you can see some there pictures of it. There it is, that's so cool. Little camera on the end and, and put it down into this burrow to see if we could find any tiger salamanders to collect the temperature down there, to use a little IR camera to see if we could also discern some depth. And it was a really fun project. We were out in the rain and the mud, like putting this tiger, <laughs> putting this robot down a bunch of squirrel burrows. And I was like, this is field robotics. That's so not cool. allowed. I've got a bunch of squirrels digging up the plants on my balcony at home, and I don't know why. Um, do you know anything about that? <laughs> as long as we're talking about squirrels. As long as we're talking about squirrels, I have to say. I'm like, what are they so doing? They're everywhere. Yeah. They're yeah. Just saying hi. <laughs> they come and I just see them. They're like just digging and I'll look at them and they'll look at me and they just keep digging and they're just throwing dirt like crazy. But I think that's so interesting that they were in that lake too with the, okay, I'll stop talking about squirrels. All right. Next time <laughs> it is time for your game, Katie Kwan. I oh. know everything about we play I Know Everything About with all of our science and stuff guests and ask questions pertaining directly to their field. This is your chance to rise to the top of our prestigious science and stuff. Very beautiful leaderboard. I oh my gosh, it's looking better and better. Look at this graphic design. Uh, we've got a lot of people tied for first place. I think you have a really good shot. Um, the, 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 and, and there will be a, a tournament of champions. Uh, we discussed that today because so many people are tied for first. We're just going to have to have a tournament of champions. So hopefully you can get your spot in the tournament of champions and earn that today in, the, in your game. Uh, the title of which is I Know Everything About Choreography. Um, and oh my gosh. Now, this isn't really about choreography because I could show you different individual moves. This is more like I know everything about dance, let's call it. Because I, Katie Kwan, am going to use my extensive dance skills uh, to demonstrate 10 different popular dances, and you're going to guess what they are. I'm so nervous. It's going to be okay. <laughs> I was going to say, are you all warmed up? No, I mean, sketches? luckily it's not like, it's all like these goofy dances that were like popular, you know, like uh, one of one of our producers asked me like, was this dance ever cool? And I was like, nah, 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 nah. It was never cool. Even from the moment it came out, it was never cool. Okay, so I have to stand up here. Okay, are you ready? Now I'm now so I'm, ready. I'm in the thing. I mean, the question is really, is everyone out there ready for these moves? Because they're about to be unleashed. Okay, here's the first one. Here we go. <clears throat> it's time to play the game. I know everything about dance. Katie Kwan, roboticist and professional dancer. It's not nerve-wracking to do dances in front of a professional dancer from New York <laughs> City at all, in case anyone was wondering. I'm very comfortable. Okay, I'll stop talking. Ready? I'm just stalling. I'm just stalling. Okay, ready? Five. You're killing it. Five, six. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Okay, this is one of my all-time favorite dances. Oh, I did it wrong. Better known as the Macarena. Oh, thank God you didn't keep making me do it. Yay! <laughs> That's the Macarena. Okay, great. You're absolutely right about that. And this one is just for you. Are you ready? I hope I do you. I hope I do you justice. Ready? She's gonna I almost me... just want you to do this. I like, was just going to yeah. say that. Yeah, She's going to make me do this forever. <laughs> it's the robot. You're doing Yay! the robot. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. I'm getting loose up. I'm getting loose up. I'm, I'm working with you here to get you a top of the uh, spot at the top of that leaderboard. Okay. Here's this next one. You ready? Yes. Oh my gosh, this is the shopping part. Oh, she got it. I didn't even it have to is. get two items out of the, off the shelf. Oh, I'm so impressed. Oh, that was so good. Okay, you ready? Are you ready for this one? That was epic. And wow, also known as one of my favorite magazines, Vogue. Vogue, yes. Pioneered by the dance icon Madonna. 
Okay, ready? ready for it? I love it. I know. Okay, you ready? Okay. Wow. And the outfit could not be better. This is for single ladies. Yes. Yay! Beautiful. So Got blown it. away. Yay! And they're wearing that like all black leotard. It just looks so together. Yes. I should have worn an all black leotard uh, next time. <laughs> next time I do the single ladies dance, I'm going to wear it for. Okay, here we go. This one I have to think about. <clears throat> Ready? I have to think about it. This is a toughie, and you are very good at it. It's <laughs> your flossing. The Yay! Floss. Your flossing. <laughs> she got it. She's like, the floss? Your flossing? Is that what you're doing for flossing? The flossing? Oh, this is great for all those kids out there who like grease. You have to do the face like this. Oh my gosh, wow. Um, this takes me back. This is the hand jive. Yes, and I mean, she's cute. Yeah, oh my God, that was amazing. Thank that you. Was, like, I think I've seen that movie 20 times. Me I too. Mean, God, Travolta. I know. I feel like every kid at some point was just like, learn the hand jive who liked Grease, you know? <laughs> um, but okay, this one is like very like 60s, very like beach blanket bingo. Ready? Oh my gosh. Yes. This dance. <laughs> do you need I me to do it more? <laughs> oh my God. It's beautiful. Is it like that so or this? is it like this? Am I doing it the wrong way? I think I might be doing my arms the wrong way. This makes more sense. Nope. You're literally killing it. I have done this dance before and I am going to try to brainstorm what I what think it's like called. Something like. <laughs> Swimming, yes, diving, the swim. Like. It's the swim. <laughs> it's the swim. You got oh it. Oh my god! I ran out with my sister. Okay, now this dance isn't so much of a dance, but more like a contest. Okay, picture there's like you know, like I'm holding like a broomstick. I asked him to get me a broomstick, but it's like, hey, oh, hey, I'm going under this thing. Oh, I'm going under. Oh, I'm going <laughs> this looks under. so good. I'm going Your under. back is very strong. Thank you. Um, you are giving me the limbo. Yes. Beautiful. That was so well done. So tired. Okay. Last one. Last one, Katie Kwan. You're nine out of ten. Here we go. Oh you ready God. for it? This is That's a short one. one. Anna is the dancing queen. Who's Sandy? <laughs> Seven, two, five, eight. I love you, Sandy. Okay. Ready? Here we go. Do you know what that is? Oh, you're dabbing for me. Yeah, you're dabbing. dabbing. <laughs> and, yes, that's right. Yay, the dab. And just oh, for... Thank you. Oh, yes. oh, and and just for our producer, Elena, I, it was really funny because I'm like, wait, how do you dab? Because, you know, I've seen people like do this. You know, I, I know what a dab is, but I'm like, but how is that like a dance? Like, it's really just like one singular move. And Elena's like... No, 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 no. And she showed me a video of a guy going like that. She was just like, you got to do it like this. And she showed me a video and the guy was just all. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did that just for Elena. That's for you, my darling, who wanted to see me dab very thoroughly. Oh, thank you so much. Well oh, my gosh, you killed it. Well done. I, uh, I didn't even know the shopping cart was a dance, like a real dance. <laughs> You know what I mean? But it's apparently it is. It's definitely like a bar bought mitzvah, like, thing. Yes. like, don't you know this man? Yeah. And I was just, like, oh, I've got to learn now. I thought it was just like a friend of mine who I saw do at a party. I just thought they were like really funny, you know, because it does, it does look like a shopping cart. Yay. Okay. Oh, my gosh. All right. Here we go. We've got another. We've got, this is your version. Oh, here, oh look at Katie Kwan. You can see half her name. <laughs> Just there, Bo. It's getting so packed. We have so many number ones. We should have a tournament of champions after we get, like, 10 people on the board. You know what I mean? Like, we really need to figure that out because, I mean, that's going to be exciting. 
Oh, we could I have can't a tournament wait. of champions where they need to guess each other's categories. Like I would know <gasps> nothing about neuroscience. Yes. That would be very hard for me. <laughs> that is great. That's a great idea. Write somebody write that down. That's a great idea. Kiki's writing that down. <laughs> Thank you for being concerned about my about my computer. That was very nice of you. Um okay, here we go. We've got another game for you. This is your version of Would You Rather. But for your version of Would You Rather, we're going to play play download, save as, or delete. We are going to show you groupings of three famous robots. And you're going to choose which you would like to download, which means like hang out with for a while. You know, you'll download, see if it's cool or not. Save, which means keep forever, or delete, which means immediately get rid of. Okay, great. First grouping of robots. We have... The, the labels are incorrect, but I think we all know that. First one is R2-D2. <laughs> the, the second one is C-3PO. And the third one is BB-8. So save, download, delete. What, what do you say? Ooh. I love the way that BB-8 rolls. So I he know. or they or it. Gosh, yeah, I don't I even know. know. Everyone has many different, different They. Yeah, they. they. Like, BB-8 robots. is a they, yes. yeah. BB-8 is they for sure. I'm gonna say BB-8 is say my BB-8. That's my yes. gut feeling. It's, it's BB-8 and is so cute. BB-8 is so cute, and mm -hmm. BB-8, I love the role. There's something about the role. I know, so graceful. I have to say, so okay. graceful. It's yeah. like any surface. I love when it goes up the little tarmac with I know. Oscar Isaac. I need to watch it. Um, I'm gonna say C-3PO, aka this gold entity in the yes. center is my yes. delete unfortunately get rid of him and, too moody uh, too worried about everything all the time too yeah. moody and i don't yeah. need that energy in my life no okay. too negative too worried about everything i love it all right next up we've got optimus prime bumblebee and megatron are you familiar with the transformers I have to say my familiarity level is uh, 10%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, but I, I love bees. I love bumblebees. So that yes. will, that's going to be my save. I love the color yellow. Makes me That's very a good choice. Sure. That's a good choice because bumblebee is a great time. Great time. Bumblebee, yeah. does bumblebee tell jokes or does All it, of it just like just fire fun. things? Okay. Yeah. All yeah. of the above. Yeah. Megatron seems like a Halloween costume that I would not want to encounter in the dark. So I'm going to go delete. Get rid of him. And Get rid of Megatron. Will be our download. download. Yes, excellent, excellent choices. See, and even though you only knew ten percent, you could tell just by looking at him. I love it. All right, next up we have K, played by Ryan Gosling in Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Data, who I should know who he's played by, but I don't <laughs> from Star Trek. I just know him as Data. You know, like. And then uh, Teddy, played by James Marsden in Westworld. All robots. All robots. Save, download, delete. So this is so fascinating to me because <laughs> there's a very long tradition of real people playing robots, uh, I which know. I kind of think is, you know, Dolores Abernathy and all, all, a lot of the folks on Westworld. But I yeah. find it so interesting that, you know, robots in our own image is very true for these characters. Um, yes. Teddy, Teddy's okay. Teddy, Teddy could be. He He's kind of one note. He could be a download. Yeah, Teddy's download. a little one note. He's a nice guy. Yeah. He's a nice guy. Yeah. And then I'm actually completely unfamiliar with K. So Me unfortunately, too. they are going to be my. Get rid of them. Delete. 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 And Data's an OG robot. Data's been around for a that's long right, time. Girl. That's right. Keep Usually it real. We've had something Keep that's been around real. for a while. Yes. You save it. Yes. And Data is smart and he knows lots of things. I love it. Yes. All right. Next up, we have Baymax, Wally, and Bender. Are you familiar with these guys? I am familiar with Wally. Bender, Wally. I feel like my fiance watches a show that has Bender on it, maybe? Bender is on, uh, what's it called? Futurama. Futurama. Yeah, Bender is on Futurama. And at the beginning, okay. yeah. in the very first episode of Futurama, I feel like Bender is about to like turn himself off or something like that. 
any Futurama Ooh. watchers in the room with me? Very meta. Yeah, right? No, yeah. And then and then yeah. the, the lead character saves him. But yeah. And then have you so seen have you seen Big Hero Six? With mm-hmm. Baymax. Oh, you gotta see it. It's so cute. I'm saying strictly based off the form factor, Baymax <laughs> seems very cuddly. Yes, super cuddly so and I'm sweet. Download on Baymax. Yes. But Wally, I mean, I've seen Wally in theaters multiple times. I cried every time. Yes, that's me a too. Saver. Wally yes, is a saver. Absolutely. Well, Wally wants to I save the world I would too. Feel that way. I feel yeah, that exactly. way too. Absolutely. What a good robot. What a good robot. And then Bender. Let's make more. Bender. Uh, uh-huh. He's moody. Moody. Nope. All right. I love it. That is it. That's it for our game. Save, download, and delete. That was super fun. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. And I hope to see you again soon. And we'll definitely see you back for the Tournament of Champions where hopefully I won't, you know, hopefully I will be dancing again. Let's be positive about it. Um, Thank you so much. Can you tell us where uh, our guests can find you on social media? Oh, yes. I am on Instagram as literally it's Katie, I-T-S, Katie. That's my name, my first name, C-A-T-I-E. And then I tweet occasionally, Katie Kwan. I don't do the I don't do the Facebook. And very controversially this week, I have decided I'm going to get a TikTok. Why so controversial? Will- You're a dancer. <laughs> you and your robots should be dancing on TikTok constantly. There's so much dancing. You're going to be huge on TikTok. That's great. I completely agree. We just have to go for it. It, it needs to happen. So this yeah. week I'm getting a TikTok and my name is TVD, but maybe I will uh, let us copy know. One of our- No, let us know. Yeah, 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 for sure. Let us know. Well, you heard it here. Follow Katie Kwan and her robots on social media. And I'm sure we'll see you again soon, at least for the Tournament of Champions. And we will robot robot out. And Katie and I will robot you out. Robot away. Awesome to talk to you, Anna. You too, Enjoy the segments, y'all. I will robot wave. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Wait, you don't follow CBS Unstoppable on YouTube? How will you know when new videos drop? You better go subscribe before you miss a crazy stim moment. Like me walking a shark or making a black hole in my backyard.